Hey everybody, Chell here with Prismatic Powders and today we're going to talk about orange peel. Orange peel is something that is sometimes baffling as to why it occurs because the truth is there are a lot of factors involved that could create orange peel. And we could spend a lot of hours digging into it all, but we wanted to talk about some simple things that you could focus on in terms of technique and process that you can do to help keep orange peel from occurring. Now, if you've been powder coating for a bit, you've probably experienced some orange peel in the finish at one time or another. But for those of you who don't know what it is or what the causes are, it is simply what happens in the finish when the powder builds or flows unevenly. And orange peel will appear as an orange peel-like texture, hence the name. And you get that instead of that nice, glassy, smooth finish that you want. And it's a bummer. Now, it can be caused by the powder being too heavy, too light, maybe the heat cycle was too slow, number of possibilities. Either way, the result is unappealing. So, because orange peel could be the result of any number of things, I think the best strategy to avoiding it is to have a systematic approach for each item you are coating. This video is going to focus on the process because these are the easiest things for us to control. And adopting a systematic approach will help you become more aware of the steps in your process. I think as coders, we can develop a tendency to cover our bases, and when we're unsure of whether there's enough powder on a particular area of a part, we potentially overdo it because we're making more passes than are necessary. Maybe we feel like cranking up the voltage if the part's not taking powder or shooting hot but these are not always the best habits. So, working from the beginning of the process to the end, here are some tips and tricks that I use to avoid getting orange peel. First things first, I reference the tech data sheets for the powder that I'm spraying. Our tech data sheets will contain the cure schedule and they will tell you a lot of other important information including the target mill thickness, the shelf life of the powder, and even things like specific gravity, which though is nerdy, is actually quite useful knowledge. All of these things will play a role in your approach to application and curing, and they'll factor in the result that you get in the finish. Now, we have the tech data sheets linked for every color on our website, so you can simply click on a color and then you'll have access to that. Once I understand how the powder should be sprayed, the next step is to check my ground to the rack, making sure that there is clean contact from the ground wire to the racking surface. Earth ground is best. And I will make sure that there is good contact from the hooks to the rack surface as well. I'm looking for bare metal to bare metal. And this is fundamental for getting good transfer efficiency, thus powder is more likely to build evenly without much resistance. The next thing I consider is selecting the tip that best suits the job. Tips should concentrate or disperse powder in a way that suits both the part and the powder. Before I apply powder to the part, I'll take a look at the powder cloud by pulling the trigger away from my parts. I'm mainly looking for powder density, overall size of the powder cloud, and it's important to note that each powder will have its own spray and build characteristics. So before I actually get powder on the part, this is why I'm assessing the settings and making changes if I don't like what I see, and I may fine tune it once I start spraying. I do want to make a side note here, if you're spraying a powder that you haven't sprayed before, spray a test piece first. This is gonna be your first clue whether or not you're actually applying it correctly because you'll be able to compare it to the swatch that you hopefully ordered. This goes for all powders and it is simply good practical wisdom. Now I like to adapt my technique for the shape of the part. The primary concern here is I don't want to build mill thickness too fast or in an uneven way. For example, the way I spray a large flat sheet of metal is going to be different than how I spray something that has multiple sides or faces. 
Since powder will wrap, if I were coating something that had multiple sides, whether that's pickets on a fence panel or spokes on a wheel, I would likely use something like a slotted tip, maybe a castle tip, and instead of directly spraying the individual sides of each picket or spoke, I would aim for the edges where the two sides meet and then move quickly, manipulating that wrap characteristic. Moving quickly is going to save me time, and there is less of a chance for powder to build up to the point of creating orange peel than if I were to spray each side individually. Being methodical in my approach here will also help me keep things even. The main point that I want to drive home here is that your techniques will play a role in how your powder builds, whether that's how close you are to the part, or how quickly you move, or how you choose to attack the project in general. After coating, the next thing I do is I always check my work at flow out. This is crucial because this is the time to make fixes because you can't do touch up work once it's cured. So now, if you have any light spots, you can just respray the parts that you need and then put it back in the oven. You can't do that if it's fully cured. Now, depending on the parts I'm spraying, I will sometimes use this to my advantage because, as I alluded to before, depending on the part, avoiding orange peel means not building mill thickness too quickly or unevenly. So, we're resisting the urge to overdo it when we make our passes. And what this means is, sometimes it's better to opt for two lighter coats to achieve the right mill thickness than one heavier coat. Okay, so the next one is pretty simple. Follow the cure schedule for the powder that you're using. The cure schedule is a temperature and then the time that your coated parts must remain at that temperature. There is no generic one size fits all cure schedule, so don't cut corners here. Under curing as well as over curing can potentially cause orange peel. And remember, you can start your cure timer when your parts are up to temperature, not when they go into the oven. Now here it's something that I try to avoid. Avoid shooting hot or hot flocking. The reason is simple. It's easy to overdo it and build mill thickness too quickly, which can lead to orange peel. Now can you hot flock and not get orange peel? Yes. However, you need to have already developed a pretty strong skill set as far as spraying technique goes. So for that reason alone, we just aren't recommending it because you cannot undo it and you're not gonna see the result until after you pull it from the oven. So here are a few other uncommon things to keep in mind just to keep your process tight. Ventilation air velocity in your booth that's too high could potentially cause an uneven buildup of powder because too much powder is being pulled toward the filters. So keep an eye on that. Also, avoid the rapid cool down or heat up cycles with your parts. So for example, don't take your hot parts out of an oven to cool in temperatures that are cold. Room temperature is fine, cool is fine, but avoid those extremes if you can. Another thing is uneven oven temperatures can lead to uneven flow out. So that is something to consider if you've maybe like bought or built a budget oven and you want to have uniform heat as much as possible, it seems to be more of an issue with those electrical ovens using the heating elements. So be careful about placement and cold spots in the oven. Now that is going to do it for this video. Feel free to share the things that have helped you avoid orange peel down in the comments below. There's just no way we could cover everything. And if we did, you wouldn't want to sit through a video of that length anyways. So there it is. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.